Good evening. I am Trevor Weston, chair of the music department. Is this on? Samash? Um, I'm Trevor Weston, chair of the music department. Thank you for coming to our capstone presentation performance. It's really special because if you think about it, all of these students started at Drew fall 2019, which means by the end of their first year, we were in lockdown. So they have been through a lot. And I think tonight's capstone represents a lot that they've been through and all the growth that they have done. If you look at the front of the program, there's a little description of what the capstone is, an experience that integrates, applies, and critiques the content and process of that discipline. But I like dictionaries. So I wanted to read a couple definitions. One is for capstone. The obvious, the top stone of a structure or a wall. Or what we're doing tonight, the crowning or final stroke, culmination, acme. I've learned a lot. We're going to hear some students perform in a way I didn't know they could perform, which is quite fitting, <clears throat> excuse me, quite fitting. I think the capstone in music, the way it has worked recently, encourages students to really take what they've learned at Drew and present something that really demonstrates their interest, connecting things in ways that I or others would not imagine. And that's really the purpose of this education, to really grow, to become the best you that there is by kind of focusing on your interest and perfecting your knowledge of those interests. And finally, I thought this was a very strange but apt definition for music. A group of musicians, which is what we have here. Also, maybe also appropriate, facing the music, which means to accept the consequences. But I think, <laughs> they're a little worried, but I think that um, you're going to be extremely entertained. I'm very proud of these students. They've done a lot of interesting work. And I think in some ways, they are reintroducing themselves to this community. So without further ado, we'll start with Hong Min Shi.
Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Chopin, and uh, we know he was growing up in Poland, and then uh, after 13 years old, he left Poland and come to Paris at the age of 18. And uh, composing music in the Paris, when he died, his body buried uh, in Leitre's cemetery in Paris, and he took a pack of Polish soil and buried it with him. So the herd, with, uh, the herd was brought back to Poland, and uh, George Sang is his source mate, and Chopin's music style was influenced by her, and some folk music was also incorporated into his works. And here is some of his famous work like Mazzucca and the Polonaise in A flat, ma uh, a flat major of 53, and the Chopin piano sonata number two is, is his famous songs. And, um, According to the legend, Chopin composed uh, these pieces to um, commemorate the national uprising in Poland. At that time, Poland was under the rule of uh, Tsarist Russia, and the Chopin, as a Pole, felt the, uh, the need for freedom and uh, independence in his homeland. Therefore, he composed, he composed this um, passionate and powerful attitude to express his desire of national independence and the freedom. And that is why Chopin is also known as the, the patriarchy piano poet. Um, Chopin's revolutionary etudes is um, piano exercises. I just played the first one. And um, composed, by, composed by him in 1831, officially titled Op 10 number 12, but often re referenced uh, to, add, uh, to as the revolutionary etudes because of the amount of musicianship and the challenging demands in the contents. The revolutionary etudes employ a wide, a, a wide range of techniques and effects, such as rapid successions of notes, strong chords, extreme tempo, and dynamic chants. Um, this music element um, creates a space for Chopin to express his emotion, but also provides a um, challenge practicing uh, repertory for the piano player. And also the revolutionary etudes have an important place in the piano repertory, um, being one of the most famous of Chopin's piano works and also one of the most challenged pieces in his history of piano performance. Uh, in, their, in addition to the revolutionary etudes, there are, there are many other famous works um, in Chopin's etude collection, such as the Winter Wind etudes and the Torrent etudes. And then the second piece is, is called Fantastic Improperative. This piece is a piano piece composed by him in 1834, formerly known as Op 36 or 66. The piece is free in structure and expression, uh, express the char characteristics of romantic music, personate, um, spirit, and uh, unpredictable. Legend, legend has it, was, uh, it that the composition was inspired by a dream in which Chopin heard a beautiful melody. And when he awoke, he immediately recorded the melody on the piano and composed the entire pieces for it. And that's why I chose these two pieces as my, as my performance repertory. I spent almost 1.5 years, uh, almost two years, to practicing these two pieces. And then, that's for myself. Um, when I first time, uh, when I first time got into the piano was 20, 2016, um, I saw some awesome anime pianists playing anime pieces on the website, and then um, I was blown away at the time, and uh, and was determined to start participating piano. I only I only played a little bit of guitar before that, um, but my guitar teacher accompaniment uh, accompanied me on piano and. That's when I felt I uh, and when I fell in love with the tone of the piano, and that's my. Just gonna bring down the okay. Seat. Okay. So I, I also like Beethoven. Beethoven, they uh, he has uh, three periods, and I gave me uh, gave myself three periods to conclude my, conclude my piano, um, entrancy. So. 
The first period, I found some favorite anime pieces from website and tried to read the score and play it. When I started to play, I found that the most difficult things、um, when I first learned the piano was to master the rhythm and play with both hands. At this time, I will, I will reduce the speed to the slowest, so slow that I can play with both hands. I believe that any beginner piano with have to all overcome this difficulty. So. So, this song is called Flower Dance, and、uh, it is the first self-taught song、uh, in my piano career. I, I interpret a part of my parties. Um, the video was recorded in 20, 2016 when I was、uh, when I was in high school, and I didn't have good condition and environment to practice.、Uh, so I bought a, a electronic piano.、Uh, it's not a piano, just like a keyboard, and then and then put it in the dormitory so that I can practice. At any time,、um, when the night is quiet, I plug the headphone and practice alone in the room. And the period was also the most confusing period for me because I liked the piano and the music so much that I was thinking about whatever to choose a music major in university every day. And then after that, in 2018, just because I decided to take an entrance examination to the、um, con conservatory of music. I met my first tutor on the piano road. Yeah, I call him.、Uh, I call her tutor because that's my first teacher. Um, she was very kind to me, and she would answer carefully when I asked questions that I didn't answer. So, during this period, she didn't know that I want to develop on the road of music. So it just teaching me, it just teaching me to practice the anime piece I like, scales fingering, and the most basically knowledge of the music history. And the music theory too, and then that's the. <laughs> Just a part. So that song is called.、Um, An、uh, a CH Hanabi is Japanese. I don't know how to how to say that pronounce, and which is also an anime pieces, and I learned it by myself when I was bored at home in 2018 to 2019. At this time, I already have some foundation in music theory, and the speed of reading score has、um, also improved. So it took me half a year to practice these pieces, and after that, it was my four years in Jiu University. I enrolled in 2019 after. After completing the in two courses, I chose music as a major. Since I chose music major, I、uh, my tutor has become strict and me.、Um, during this period, I came into contract with、um, Hanon, Journey, and、uh, other piano editors, and、uh, it was also the first time I stepped into the door of classical music. So, during this period, I I I held session about the、uh, the epidemic. I took online class in China and、uh, practiced the piano for at least four hours、um, a day. And the first class of my major music theory one and the keyboard study was also the first time I met my advisor, Trevor Weston. <laughs> and、um, my piano professor is called I don't know if it's here. I I think it's here. And、uh, yeah, and but but it's meet online, so the first time. And、uh, thank you for for your care these four years.、Um, And let me continue to go on the road of music. So, during this period, I also participated in the Jiu University Orchestra、um, and the chorus, the, cor the vocal vocal instruction.、Uh, met a lot of good professor. They are all very good. So, so far, I have set foot in the other files of music major. The experience of participating in the orchestra and the choral is really valuable.、Um, this sense of、um, collective honor. Is incorporates on the individual stage. So in the past four years, I also 
got to know um, many classical music figures in different periods, like such as uh, Bach and uh, Haydn in the Baroque period, and Mozart, Beethoven, and uh, Romantic Chopin, like and uh, Liszt. They taught me how to um, appreciate classical music. Playing these celebrated songs um, at the same time also improved my piano skills. And then I have also grown a lot in the past four, uh, past four years. After graduation, I plan to continue to try to apply for a master's degree uh, like, and, and, uh, in piano or, major, uh, or music production. I'm very grateful to everyone who has helped me in these four years. My tutor, my parents, even though they are not there today, and um, we have their support and I would not be here. And all the, music, uh, all the music major professors and my friends. So I also wish uh, all, graduates, all graduate students a bright future. And uh, thank you all. Two pictures is my first video that I watched in the in the Billy Billy. It's called a uh, Chinese YouTube. And then I just saw their videos and makes me to play the to practice the piano. So thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Candace Ola. I'm a double major in business and music, and before I came to Drew, I only intended on minoring in music, but something inside of me told me I should fully major in it, because music has been important to me my whole life, and I'm really happy I did, because I got to meet great professors such as uh, Dr. Weston, uh, Professor Ingram, and Professor Sprout, that all helped me get, get me where I need to be uh, today. So my capstone presentation is Swinging in the Spirit. Um, the piece that I chose to rearrange into a jazz piece is Precious Lord, Take My Hand. It was originally written by Thomas A. Dorsey. Uh, he's born in Georgia and he was, his father was a Baptist preacher and his mother was a piano teacher. He's known as the father of black gospel music and he combined Amer African American church hymns with uh, blues and jazz. When this piece first was written, it was considered a worldly combination because it combined blues and jazz, not usually the type of genre that gospel hymns would usually be written to. So the inspiration for this, uh, I was born and raised in going to church, going to the gospel hall. Uh, so gospel music has always been an important thing in my life on how I sing, how I, you know, uh, analyze music as well. And a little bit more on me as a musician, I've been playing guitar for around 13 years now, and I initially was classically trained. So coming into Drew and learning jazz was a whole different thing for me, because if you know, jazz is very freeing and just, there's no rules to jazz, and playing only classical music was hard because it's so structured with scales and whatnot. So after joining the jazz ensemble and take, taking classes such as uh, History of Jazz, I've learned to fall in love with the freedom of jazz. And through artists such as Ella Fitzgerald, which you know is one of the most important jazz singers of all time, Hoagie Carmichael, my, my personal favorite, he wrote two of my favorite jazz standards, such as uh, Georgia on My Mind and The Nearness of You. 
Uh, Miles Davis, as you know, one of the most important trumpet players of all time, and Wes Montgomery, who to me is one of the best jazz guitarists of all time as well. And my uh, intent with the song was that usually I've heard Precious Lord take my hand as a country folk blues piece. I've never heard it like as a fully jazz piece. So with my arrangement, uh, it's more, you're gonna hear a more simplified version because it's just the chords, but it can definitely be arranged for bass, uh, piano, trumpet, sax, and so on. So the composition process for this piece, I decided to take vocal lessons. I grew, I grew up singing, but I never had like structure and taught proper technique. So I learned a lot of breathing exercises. I learned how to compose a vocal melody, which I've never done before. And I was able to find comfortable keys for my voice and what works for me. And I was able to learn uh, about arranging chords around my voice as well. So this is my piece. It's in the key of E flat major. And my approach to this song was with the, usually a lot of jazz uh, arrangements, a lot of major seven chords, a lot of diminished seven chords. Um, you'll hear in some of the parts of the song, I go from a major seven chord that's in the key to a diminished seven chord that's out of the key. To me, that just gives it the more jazzy feel it's just in simple terms. So yeah, hope you enjoy.
My name is Krista Bella Fortna, and I am a triple major here at Drew University, and I study chemistry, music, and French. And so my capstone presentation today is just a very brief summary, really just the Cliff Notes version of one of my undergraduate honors theses that I did, um, particularly my French and music thesis, where I was looking at how the reinvention of the flute in the 1830s led to what we would now call like the French style of the late Romantic composition period. And particularly how we still hear a lot of these traces even in American composition some decades later. So to break that all down, <laughs> what we're talking about is, actually no, I should contextualize. I play the flute. <laughs> I have for a very long time. Um, it's one of my favorite things to do, and I have played at almost every music at noon here, actually. Fun fact. That's me playing my flute at my senior recital about two weeks ago. So uh, maybe consider cheating, but I did take the easy way out. I've already played, <laughs> so we're just going to go through some minute markers that highlight the key takeaways from my honors thesis. So starting off, in the 1830s, or prior to the 1830s, I should say, the flute was largely not considered a solo instrument. It was very common and popular in orchestras, chamber ensembles, royal courts, but there wasn't a lot of solo literature for the flute. And that's just particularly because of the engineering of the flute itself at this time. It was made of wood, it had a, what you'll refer to as a conical bore, so it was a tapered tube as opposed to just a normal cylindrical tube. And so it was a very quiet instrument, and it had a lot of inconsistencies, especially when going from a very low note to a very high note. You couldn't be as loud as we can be today. It wasn't as consistent with the intonation or how strong some of those notes would come out today. And so in 1833, a uh, German flutist, Theobald Böhm, reinvented the flute into what we would now kind of see as the modern flute. Um, but I'm going to refer to it as the Bohm model flute because that is his name, and I will give him credit <laughs> for that invention. And some of the biggest changes that we saw with the Bohm model flute as opposed to previously standard flutes were, in my opinion, the most dramatic change, the change from a conical tapered tube to a cylindrical, totally straight and consistent tube. Because even just in that small change, the physics behind the music you can now get is wildly different. The flute can now take a lot more air at once, so I can play a lot louder. I can play stronger, even at the very low register or at the very high register, which I previously couldn't do. There was like a really strong section somewhere in the middle, but the highs and the lows were not as strong. They couldn't cut over an entire orchestra like they can today. Certainly wouldn't hear them in marching bands, right? <laughs> um, another change that was made, again, just in the genuine, genuine physics of this instrument, uh, we now have more consistent sizing of the keys along the flute, the tone holes. And we now have way more keys on the flute. Uh, previous standard models of flute 
were only five or eight keys. The Baroque flute, some 200 years earlier, just had one key for the pinky, and it looked a little bit more like a sideways recorder. Um, and so because of this, we have new fingering systems, which in essence should have fixed a lot of these problems with consistency and intonation, making these big jumps a little bit easier. And so on paper, you go, wow, this kind of fixed a lot of flute playing that made a lot of really popular flutists cranky at the time, right? But if your whole career in the 1830s is a professional flutist, you don't want to be handed a new flute and then told to relearn how to play the flute. That's a really detrimental blow to your career at that point. And so a lot of people who were well-established flutists didn't quite change over as quickly as one might assume. And so it was a very gradual change, but I think we can still trace a lot of these musical aspects back to that genuine invention. In particular, with the arrival of Paul Taffanel at the Paris Conservatory um, in the very late 1800s, very, very early 1900s, Paul Taffanel was a flutist, and he was actually born in 1840, 1844, I think, something along those lines. So as he was growing up and learning how to play the flute, he was learning how to play the flute on this new flute. And so he didn't have these hesitations and reservations that more popular flutists at the time would have had, being like, oh darn, I don't want to relearn how to play my instrument. <laughs> and so as he was coming into his own musical maturity, he knew a lot of things that the flute could do that the common musician did not quite understand just yet. It wasn't really popularized yet. And so by the time he worked his way all the way up to a professor at the Paris Conservatory, which I hope you all know, it is one of the most popular, not most popular, but most well-known music conservatories in the world in Paris, France. A lot of very famous people went there and learned how to play music, how to write music, um, conducting orchestras, this kind of thing. So he was a professor here and he was getting a little fed up, one could say, with the fact that there still wasn't a lot of solo literature for flute. And if there was, it wasn't taking full advantage of this new technology that we can say we now have in the late 1800s, very, very early 1900s. Um, and so he wanted to do his best to redesign that. I'm trying to stray away from giving him credit for like creating this musical style because a lot of it probably would have come about naturally as more flutists started to learn and play on this new flute. But when you are a tenured professor at the most famous music conservatory in the world, you do happen to have a lot of influence, particularly through his commissions. So at the end of the year at the Paris Conservatory, they have what we would call les morceaux de concours, which is somewhere in between a jury final exam and just a popularized contest for musicians and flutists around the world and he would commission a new French flute piece every year to really try and get the ball rolling of like, look, the flute is so awesome. Look at all these things it can do that we just haven't taken advantage of yet. And so I paid three pieces in my senior thesis recital. Um, Paul Taffanel's Andante, Pastoral, and Scherzettino, which is kind of like the textbook foundation of this French flute music. I played another piece called Prelude and Scherzo by Henri Bousset, another one of these commissions that Paul Taffanel commissioned just the year after. And they sound very similar, but they express different ideals of what the flute can do, particularly in its expressive and lyrical quality that wasn't taken advantage of before because we couldn't get these extreme color changes that we can now. We couldn't get this consistent intonation that we can now. Um, and so just as a small demonstration, no, pause. Dramatic color changes, dynamic changes, consistency in intonation, pitch jumping, etc. And so one of the things that I put together within my thesis was pinpointing a lot of specific points within an American piece decades later called Poem for Flute and Orchestra by Charles T. Griffiths, who was born and raised in America and actually studied in Germany, not France, but during his time in Europe was exposed to a lot of Impressionist music at the time, French pieces at that time. And so whether or not it was intentional, what you'll hear in Griffiths' poem is a lot of French influence. So it still sounds like an American piece. It is an American piece. I'm not arguing that it's some secret hidden gem that the French historians should have known about, but it's written like a French piece in the way the phrases are composed, in the way that the flute itself is used as a vocalist rather than a solo instrument. Um, so one of the things that we could talk about is the range of pitch and color, jumping from the highest note on the flute to the lowest note on the flute. 
changing from a very gentle, airy sound to a dark, brassy, rich tone. We can see very, very high note, very, very low note. They sound very different, but you can still hear them both very strongly and with a very dramatic color change at the end. I love that retardando. Um, another thing that we see, because the flute can do a lot more, we're seeing the flute now used as like a sound effect. Think of like very, very dense chromatic passages that might make you think of like a windy storm as opposed to a very elegant and regal piece where the focal point is the fact that you have a flute playing. color changes I was talking about earlier. And we also saw in there very broad range of dynamics. While you can still get gradual dynamics on these older flutes, it wasn't as extreme. Should have done that earlier, my apologies. But then one last thing that I would like to highlight before I think I should just play this whole piece for you, it's only about 10 minutes, um, is once again articulating this idea that this is an American piece. It sounds like an American piece written in the 20th century because it is. We have a very fun moment in the middle where I'm playing in 2-4, but my pianist, Professor Iskowitz, is not. He's in 6-8. Might not notice it at first, but it becomes very obvious when we start having a duple 1 and 2 and over 1-2-3-2-2-3. Two, three, two, two, three. Very fun, very American. <laughs> um, but it's written in such a way that we have these long lyrical phrases that are classic French romanticism, classic French music of the late 18th century. And so one example that I would like to show, let's try. If I'm correct, this is also the one where I'm in one meter, Professor Iskowitz is in another, topped off with a walking bass line underneath all of this, but it's still written in the same style as these French pieces. transitions into another section. Um, but just to once again reiterate some of the things that I'd like you to listen for in this American piece, written like a French piece, huge broad range of color, very airy sounds, very dark, rich, brassy sounds, huge, huge, huge range of pitches that didn't exist on previous model flutes. It only went down to a G. I can now go down to a B if I really wanted to. But in this piece in particular, we do have every single note that the flute can play, which is pretty awesome. And one of my favorite things that I've noticed in performing now three French pieces, well, 
two, and then a French style piece back to back. What I have coined the French pullback. <laughs> so it starts with a very slow, almost haunting melody right in the beginning. We build up all this energy, this tension, dense chromatic passages, and then right at the end, within one single pitch, we bring it all back to that haunting, airy, very still, transparent theme from the very beginning. So please enjoy Poem for Flute and Orchestra by Charles D. Griffiths.
and thank you once again to Professor Iskowitz, who is my pianist for this recital. Hello everyone, my name is Jamir James, and my capstone project is, gonna, is called The Human Tendency, and it's an experiment um, that I did. So a little background, um, before I came to Drew, uh, I had an affinity for music, always liked it, always enjoyed it. Um, so at first I started looking into production um, using digital audio workstations known as DAWs, um, and that's just creating things like on the computer, putting instruments in, and putting it in on a MIDI file, like playing it out that way rather than playing it live. Um, so when it came time for the Capstone project, I wanted to incorporate um, some of that skill that I had just because I'd grown a lot. Drew 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 the music theory classes and music composition, and I wanted to um, incorporate that as well with teaching. Um, me being a music major, um, I also have a minor, minor in biology, um, so I also incorporated that by um, building up a experiment. So my founding principle um, is what I believe is that everyone is able to create music, uh, whether that be age-wise or just different mindsets where you're from. Anything like that, I feel like everybody has the ability to create music. Um, Webster Dictionary's um, de um, definition being music is a vocal, instrumental, or mechanical sound uh, having rhythm, melody, or harmony. So even if you have a simple rhythm, um, which I feel like everyone create, can create, um, that would be known as music. Uh, but I was thinking, and I was in the process of thinking, why isn't a lot of people musicians or a lot of people not creating music? Um, there's people that are not, not interested, obviously, but there's a few things like access to um, certain instruments or digital audio workstations or resources like funds or money to buy such things, as well as doubt, like I don't think I would be a good musician or I don't think I should should create music, I, it's not something I practice, or just even being unaware, as in like you don't think, um, some people just don't think that, oh, I can uh, make music, like I have the ability to do that. Um, so the idea was to uh, give this, be the, be the medium for students to create a complete track of music. So my goal was to find some students that uh, have never created anything before and be the person to take their ideas and put it into a piece and just be the output of that. So uh, my plan uh, was just to have some, some guidelines so it's not very uh, random uh, and to be controlled as well. Um, I was only able to get two students, um, one being my friend and one being a random student, uh, just because it's a little difficult for, um, you know, to like get people to go to your dorm for a few hours, especially if they're random. They don't really want to do that. Uh, <laughs> but. Um, some things that I um, wanted to set up is to give them a structure, at least to start off with, so it's not just throwing them into the water um, trying to swim. Uh, for instance, I asked them to tap out like a BPM, a tempo, um, just to get how fast or slow the song would be. And in them tapping it out, I also was, was able to get their time signature, um, which is which usually four beats per minute. Um, and I was also on the selection of sounds, I was able to um, get an array of sounds on my digital audio workstation just to allow them to really be creative in the process and to tell me what they wanted, whether that was very directly, like I want a horn, or um, I want the sound of like whales in the background, something like that. So a large array, and um, I gave them a quick uh, like crash on a one course, um, just on some terms um, and some stuff about basic of music, just to like better streamline communication to make things uh, just work a lot faster and better for both of us. All right, I also have some rules in place for me, specifically, because I didn't want to sway anything that the um, students were creating. I, didn't, I just wanted to be uh, just like a, almost a tool for them to use to create the music. Um, so I didn't want to give them any, I didn't give them any suggestions on what was correct or normal, um, unless they were asking like, oh, this note doesn't sound right. I wanted to be like, insert some random reference, and I would be able to assist them with that, but I wouldn't say, you should do this, you should do that. Um, I also conversed them with ideas on that they had, like they would um, talk out like, oh, I want this to sound more staticky, and we would talk about it and find the exact sound they were looking for. And I also gave them time to, you know, really marinate and think on what they wanted to do. So it would be different days 
um, after we had a session, they would, I would send them the files, they would go back home, listen to it, think about it, next time they come in, um, you know, they would have a different idea to put in. So, for my results, the first student, um, he's a junior, a business major, he made the song called, or try called Give It Up, right? And um, so, just a few little things about him, just for background information, loves jazz, funk, R&B, um, and experiences in music. Um, only thing that he does musically, he just sings everywhere. Not really like in a format of like choir, but just like singing in his room, singing in the hallways. Um, and for the track, he really wanted it to feel like a waiting room is how he started it off. He said, I really want it to sound like I'm in a waiting room, um, which I was like, okay, we can work from there. And he wanted the instruments to be having a conversation with each other. Um, and the way he was describing things to me was mostly through singing the melodies and singing the rhythms. Um, if he were singing at drums, he would like, like do like a And I would just put that in. Um, so this is going to be a 81 BPM. Um, and one quote that uh, I got down when he was talking about it, I really want to make something cool and nice um, just to listen to. So here's the first piece for the student and this from student one, and this is Give It Up. And I also would like to let you know, uh, there is it's a little bassy at times, um, and I don't know how they would sound on these speakers as a heads up. <laughs> So that was the first student's piece. Uh, you can applaud, they're, all, they're watching the stream, so they did a good job, I feel like. Um, and for taking their first stab at music, I feel like uh, they did a great job. There was a lot of things um, that they were telling me throughout the piece, um, saying like, I want something to sound like it's approaching, and I took that as um, like some small volume, and we agreed, it's like some small volume, increasing in volume, um, moments of calm after action, so when like there would be a phrase, and it would go back to like the baseline um, loop, um, 
they were excited to ha add horns, and they wouldn't. They wanted it to feel like you were waiting in a big white room, um, with things coming in and out. And as you can see, there was chants. They also wanted the chants. And for student two, um, their song was called Cory Gone, and uh, she was a biology. She's a biology major, um, senior. Um, she loves indie music, and um, her ex experience in music includes singing in the shower, and being in middle school band for about a year. Um, and for her track, it was a lot more um, less specific as the other student, where it was, um, where the previous student was like, oh, I want horns, or I want this certain sound. Hers was more abstract, like, oh, I want the sound of like haziness, or well, she wanted the base idea of creating um, the feeling of just being conscious, like just be, becoming conscious, and how that would sound. Um, so it was a lot more difficult to do, but we did get through it. Um, we started with a selection of sounds that was picked out, and it was a lot of trial and error coming up with the different melodies and harmonies and uh, rhythms just going through it. Um, and she wanted to let you guys know that it's representing a Pokemon move from the game called Calm Mind. So here's Porygon by Student 2. So that was the second student's piece. Um, so this one, as I said, was more abstract. So saying things like, uh, the, it just sound like the first conscious moments, but like they're very hazy. Um, and the, the, like, the background piece that you're hearing where it's like one note and it jumps up a fifth, uh, it was the, the static sound that she wanted to sound like the tadpole's first jumps. So very specific, um, warbly bass, sounding like an underwater cave, um, where it was just me adding reverb, which means just adding it, making it sound like it's in a bigger venue, like this one, and um, also taking down higher frequencies to make it sound more muffled. Um, and also making it sound like a mechanical heartbeat, the bass at the beginning and near the end as well. Um, so some things that I took away from this um, after they were done with it, uh, was for the first student, the rhythm that they were um, using, which sort of makes sense because their um, interest like jazz and funk, um, it had some swing um, and some bossa nova rhythms as well as syncopation and the drums especially, um, which was very interesting since it's like I could see their like cogwheels turning when they were putting things in. Um, for the sound and the tonality, uh, it was a lot of use of chromaticism, but not in a negative way where it was just random notes everywhere. Um, it would take detours, um, just going out just a little bit, but coming back in in a very useful way. The horns were using different counterpoint and harmony going up and down, away from each other, coming back. Um, and some struggles for the student in the first piece um, was just sorting everything um, and arranging it, like finding out what's going to go in the beginning, the middle, the end. Um, and also trying not to make things clash, like a lot of high sounds or different notes just that doesn't work out. And for Porygon, for student two, um, there was a lot more sustained notes, as you heard. It was very um, droney, 
um, and the rhythms were very straight, and she wanted a more like swirling uh, rhythm, as she said, um, which was like the twinkling you heard near the beginning in the choir around the inn. Um, it was basically fully, fully major. Um, the choir was using it was as a form of support for the main piano, especially the nostalgic piano um, in the like bridge section, I would say. Um, and it was a ton of reverb um, that she wanted to do. She really wanted it to sound very huge, and a lot of ear candy was um, something that she was suggesting. And for her, struggles were um, mostly finding the exact sound based on the idea. Um, like I remember her talking about, like I want something to be like pins and needles, and I was really confused. Um, and then she was more like, like you know, when that numb TV static feeling. And I started to understand it a little more, but also just knowing what should be added from there and continuing to make it more coherent. Um, but overall, I had a very um, wonderful time doing this experiment. I was able to just see different ideas I wouldn't think to do, um, especially coming from people who have never touched music. And I feel like I did um, was able to like prove the point that um, that you could just grab somebody off the street and ask them to do some stuff. And well, not grab them, <laughs> but <laughs> but you know, uh, I feel like anybody could do such a thing, especially with a medium um, if they don't have the resources to do so and the teachings to do so. Um, but that is my capstone project. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Lucas Shearson, and uh, so for my capstone project, initially uh, I was thinking of doing a recital here. There's a tradition, sort of, a lot of people tend to uh, sing on this stage, and that's a great thing to, uh, for people who have studied voice, um, and that's a great thing to do. Um, but as we were talking and getting closer to the day, I realized that I wanted something I was going to be able to like take with me to actually have some new skills instead of more performance opportunity. So I went with a different route of taking that same idea of performance and just making it into a collection of audition tapes. My goal was to create a small collection that covers all of the common asks um, in order to build quick virtual auditions since so often um, now we are being asked to build them all entirely online. So um, it pretty much comes down to uh, four easy steps. You pick your songs and create your portfolio. This is the same process for um, creating a regular songbook that you would take with you to auditions, um, largely, though there are some uh, changes which I'll go over. Um, then going to the recording process, and let me tell you, I sure learned a lot of pitfalls in that area. Uh, then you get to edit it and put it all together. At this point, I say you've been the performer, director, film crew, and now also the editor, but it's not that difficult, actually. Um, you'd be surprised. Uh, and lastly, I'll go over uh, where to share this sort of thing and also uh, show you an example of a tape that I made specifically for this instance, quick and easy, using this process. Um, so to start uh, in assembling your portfolio, uh, you want to start with the end in mind. What are you actually making this for? Uh, for me, I have a large uh, musical theater background, so I know that I'm going to be looking forward to that in the future. So uh, that also is very common to ask for self-tapes, so it makes perfect sense for this. Um, but I also know that I tend to gravitate towards jazz and contemporary styles, so I'm looking at uh, forward with that in mind and those kinds of shows. Um, additionally, I like to perform in choral works, and uh, I like to keep my classical options open because that's where the money is, low-key. Um, so uh, I wanted to make sure I had all of that covered in as little songs as possible so that I could uh, you know, uh, use them and just cut really quick clips and send them off. Um, so, uh, basically, I looked at what they were going to ask for and tried to combine that with what I'm good at. So, we're looking for songs that have a range of styles that are diverse. Um, songs that, uh, for theater specifically, fit into cuts that I can cut down to an 8-bar, 16-bar, and 32-bar cut, ideally, um, so that you have everything you need. Um, Specifically, you want to have songs that aren't going to be the most common. Usually in audition rooms, people say, you know, they have to see everyone's uh, audition. So you want to do something that's a little bit different, not the most normal going to stand out, and you want to really show off your skills. Um, you just need to make sure that you have everything taken care of. Um, yeah, sorry. 
um, you have to make sure that you can find a component for them. This can be a tricky process. Now, if you're, you want, you can invite an accompanist to be a part of this process and like play alongside you. Um, for me, I chose to do it using a digital background, A, to get the experience of doing that as I won't always have access super easy to any accompanist, but also because when I do self-tapes, I am a mess. I repeat and repeat when I'm in front of a phone. It's very different than just talking to people, I feel. So I knew I was going to be doing a lot of takes, and I did not want to have to do that with an accompanist in the room. Um, but they each have their own challenges, and I'll continue to speak about that later. Um, so for mine specifically, what I went through, uh, I started with Out of Your Head. Um, I'm just going to talk about why I chose them so you can kind of get a feel for how you would pick your own portfolio. Um, I chose this because it is the shortest piece. It is the only one on the list that can actually fit into an 8-bar cut. It's incredibly hard to do. Um, and it shows off in that 8-bar cut pretty much the full of my chest register, low to high. And that's kind of what you are looking for with that. Um, then I moved on to the Benedictus, which is sort of the opposite. It's a longer, slower piece. It's classical. It's to show off the technical range. Um, it shows off the higher register for me and sort of navigating that. So that's important. Um, Sibella is a great piece I worked on with uh, Judy Tate here. All of these, by the way, I've worked on with the incredible uh, Professor Sands here. She's my voice teacher. Um, but I worked on specifically, uh, it's a very acty piece and it's also very cuttable. Um, what did you mean by love is a departure from what we've seen before. It's important to have a couple pieces or a piece that is not from uh, theater or is not like classically background if you're trying to do more contemporary stuff because they will ask for something that's just a song. So that's that pick for me and it's sort of a replacement on the opposite side of the Benedictus because it shows off the same register in the complete opposite style. Um, I'll be here, does the low register, so now we've covered all aspects of the voice and also does a jazzier style which also diversifies for style and as it is plenty is just uh, vocal uh, acrobatics basically to show I, I can sing more difficult pieces um, and so uh, that is the total selection and from that you can get a large number of diversifying auditions between the various cuts. Um, as for the recording process itself, um, personally I chose to record in the uh, practice rooms on campus because I was going for sound quality. Now I learned a couple things in that process that I would probably not uh, prioritize that again. Um, I was intending on recording with a microphone um, and if you do this, uh, it's probably not going to be much better than your actual phone unless you have like a boom mic scenario. The reason is because um, the camera is so far away from you that the microphone will probably be in the shot if it's close enough to pick you up. So um, just take note of that. Most people are honestly expecting your cell phone quality around that, that, you know, our phones are so good now. The important thing is to get a tripod because you want it to be able to face at your head level and not slip, which is really important and can make the process really annoying. Um, as far as soundproofing goes, obviously having a soundproofed room is really nice, um, but anything soft you can add to the area is going to multiply that tenfold, and there are also some tricks you can do in the editing process I'll go over to make that even better. Um, for your accompanist, now if you had chosen to have a live accompanist, this is going to be a little bit of a problem because you have to actually make it so that they are out of the shot, but not too quiet or too loud that you cannot be heard. Um, it's a tricky process to make sure you get them the right amount away, and I'm a little glad I didn't, wasn't trying to squeeze us all into a practice room with that. Um, but if you have a track, you're faced with the other problem, now your track is in the recording. So a really common tip is to put a headphone in one ear and uh, just go that way, keep it quiet so that it's not picked up in the audio, and usually that does uh, well enough. Um, it's nice if you can have repeat access to the room. Uh, as I'll go over later, some auditions ask for a live slate or for uh, certain specific things. A lot of theater auditions will ask for monologues. So if you can have the same space, that gives a more professional look. So it would be nice to have that as well. As for framing, you want to make sure you're nice and even in the middle of the shot. These are both terrible examples. On the right here, I'm way too low, and on the left, I'm way too, I mean, I'm not even in the frame. Um, and on that note, you can see right at my nostrils. So that's why you want it to be right here, facing right at your face. Uh, and 
uh, if I had done this again, I would invest in a ring light because you can see these circles in my eyes. It's kind of hard to avoid that. Um, if you have to go for one of these two, it's hard to get it perfect. Too much is better than too little. You can see that's the same photo there, but you just crop it a little bit, and I'll show you how to do that online later. Um, but the most important thing through this process is to not tire yourself out. Um, people say your best takes are going to be your earlier ones. That's true, and you can uh, strategize that way. Do all of your rep before you start to repeat rep, um, because you will get exhausted by the time you've gotten to the end of your songbook. So my recommendation would be to go through everything and then start to do patch fixing. Um, and you know, there's always another day if you have to do that. Um, now, finally, you're at the editing phase. It's a lot easier. You can use any editing software. I used ClipChamp, which is online and free, um, but beware of other sites that will watermark you unexpectedly. Um, all you do is you have to drag your files down there. You can see where the timeline is. That's at the bottom. And then you can separate the audio from that. And you will want to uh, lower the audio on your own recording so that the background noise is no longer audible when you are silent. This is usually just a little bit of a lower. Um, and from there, you'll align the other audio track and just uh, set that level so that it's uh, an appropriate sound through headphones or normal laptop speakers, because other speakers can change the level and you don't know what they're going to hear. Um, from there, you do that process essentially for all of the videos. Oh, and you can see up at the top there, there's that big screen around. That's how you would modify the top or bottom of the video. It's just a slide on this uh, website, and it's very similar on a lot of other um, softwares. Um, yeah. Uh, finally, you have these collection of songs, so the only thing left to do is to actually send it out to places. Um, you find auditions uh, either online uh, through Backstage, which is just the most forward front-facing like theater one, or uh, any other websites. It, they're all over the internet. Um, in person, uh, or even this works for various like music association, music or theater associations or groups. Um, so basically, you would find these auditions, see what they're asking for you, and pick two pieces that would work. You selected a large range, so you, will, you should have enough. Um, and you cut them down to the appropriate lengths, edit them together. It's nice and simple. You can add title cards, if they allow that, and darkness, which is what I've done in the example. Um, though, like I said, some do require slate, uh, like live slate, and other songs, perhaps like monologues or a dance or something. And those all you can. Uh, do that way uh, separately, like I said, if you can get back into the room. Um, one final thing, and then I will show you this example. Uh, if you are editing them together in the final process, beware of uh, altering the ratio, aspect ratio, for the second video based on the first one. I was not aware of this process. Um, and then I went back and rewatched my video recently, and the second video was cropped to the aspect ratio of the first video. So you'll see my head gets a little close to the top of the frame. Um, Anyway, uh, I have chosen uh, two 32 bar cuts for you, uh, which would be appropriate for a choral or classical audition. I chose it because uh, it's a classical repertoire, which is what I've worked on mostly here at Drew, so I felt it was a good example of my work here. As it is plenty, and it's admitted, the children happy and the car, the car that goes so far, and the wife devoted to this as it is, to the work and the banks. Let his thinning parent his altar give thanks, give thanks. All that was thought. As like as not was not, when nothing was enough but love, but love and the raw future of an intransigent nature, and the betraying smile betraying but a smile, and that is not as not. Forget, forget, forget. Benedictus, 
Dios cuida mí y no me Hello, my name is Jackie Snyder, and so for my capstone, I wanted to do something that I didn't really get to focus on in school that I really enjoy. So I'm a music major and a film minor, and I really enjoy video editing. And so I didn't want to be in the video, so thankfully one of my coworkers, she knew of a band, and I was able to reach out to them and ask them if they wanted a video. And they said yes, and it just went on from there. Hey Mike, you still play the bass and drums or whatever? <laughs> yeah.
I promise the video quality looked so much better on the computer. <laughs> What's up? Hi. <laughs> How do I get out of here? I clicked escape. Oh, here we go. What about escape three times? I did actually click it three times, and that seemed to work. You've all seen this? Yeah. No, I'm <laughs> kidding. Point. I'm kidding. Cool. All right. Well, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, we started a band. <laughs> um, <laughs> we call ourselves Duo Tone. Um, my name's Elias Baguli, yeah, and my, this is... Oh, sorry, Doc. Yeah, this is Duo Tone. My name's Ethan Gobea. Cool. Um, so first, we want to read, we kind of made up a mission statement. Elias is a double, music, uh, double major in business and music, so naturally. Mission statements are the way, so our mission statement reads, Duo Tone was created to give us an outlet to express ourselves musically outside of clubs and organizations sanctioned by the university. The experience the band has given us as aspiring self-made performers is one we wish to encourage and share with other musicians on campus to inspire their own musical journeys and create a stronger campus culture surrounding music. A little wordy, but very true. Um, our goals uh, as performers, as individuals, and as students of the university um, in our four years, and especially due to, uh, Professor Weston hit it on the nose, uh, due to COVID, that cut down a lot of the ability to have some of these experiences earlier, which a lot of us relate to, all of us probably relate to. Um, so like in the mission statement, to break it down, we really, really wanted with this project to bring music culture back to Drew in a way that, like Ethan said, isn't a part of the music department necessarily or isn't a part of a club on campus, which we f involve ourselves with a ton. Um, there's a lot of really talented musicians at this school, and um, we, you know, really hope to bring that out um, in doing this. Um, in addition, creating our own path, that means this is something Ethan and I really want to do with our lives, and music will always be super important to both of us, so uh, it kind of felt like this band was formed before we even made it official because Ethan and I have just been playing together for so long. But um, we, you know, this has been a great experience to kind of soft launch what it will be like to be performers in the real world. Um, and like I kind of mentioned, we wanted to establish musical traditions, which we'll get into, and revamp old musical traditions. That's a cute picture of us. Yeah. There's a lot of those. Um, so the history, how did Duotone get here? And Elias went into it a little bit. We met um, freshman year kind of right away, played together a lot, but pandemic threw a big thing in that. Um, but for our own individual histories, um, I had always had instruments around before I knew how to play them, before I could walk, before I could talk. <coughs> um, my parents showed me really, really great music right from the start. Um, bands like Green Day, Blink-182, Nirvana, and Pearl Jam that really solidified my early influences. Once I eventually learned how to music, um, in fourth grade, I learned the drums through a program at school. Um, hey. <laughs> other than that, yeah, right. Um, other than that, I am self taught on guitar, which I did the year after, so fifth grade. Just because I'm a music major doesn't mean I can't count. Um, a few years later, picked up bass, very similar to guitar. I cheated, um, picked one I already knew. Um, like I mentioned, an early influence in American rock and pop, mainly in the 90s and 2000s. Um, what else? So getting to high school, um, my sophomore year, I took an AP music theory class, and that kind of <clears throat> put on paper these things that I realized, oh, I do know this. Um, I just had never had the education to kind of put the words to it. Um, so there I realized I really have an affinity for arrangement and competition and harmony and not even doing it or producing it myself, but the principles behind it as well. Um, AP music theory in high school was a strong foundation there. Um, I realized kind of later half of high school, I could kind of sing a little bit. I had been around music so long, I know what the notes sound like, and I can make them, and hey, they don't sound that bad. Um, so coming into college, I had a really strong music theory background. I had a little bit of performance background. I had always been in ensembles throughout high school. 
um, but never vocally until, of course, as many of you know, 36 Madison Avenue, which Lucas was also a part of for all four years. Um, that was my first formal experience with any sort of vocal performance, any sort of vocal music. Um, and three months after kind of being accepted into the group, um, a pandemic happens, our music director leaves, and the entire group says, hey, Ethan, you're the music director. <laughs> I'm like, that's silly. I don't know how to sing. All of you have been singing in groups a lot longer than I have. Um, I had also never written or arranged or orchestrated anything for any sort of vocal group. So the pandemic, while it kind of sucked, obviously, just a little bit, um, really gave me time to put that all together. So I downloaded a software called MuseScore, um, kind of took the very short time I had with another music director and watched what he did very hawkishly and copied it. And you can see that in my arrangements. Um, that's something that still hasn't changed. But otherwise, um, kind of just from being around the group so much, I learned kind of how to arrange for them. Um, so my arrangement style is still very Madhav specific. Um, but now that I am moving on to the next chapter, hopefully it will diversify. But just another thing I'm technically self-taught on. Um, I think that's all my history. So cool. Now it's your turn. History. What is it? Um, I, like Ethan, also have been playing uh, instruments and have been really enraptured by music for a long time. I started playing the piano, I think, when I was five, maybe about six. I don't know. I, uh, it was really fun at first. Um, I didn't take it super seriously. It was just something I kind of enjoyed doing repeatedly. And eventually, around middle school, I really started clicking with it as an art, I realized that I had gotten proficient at it and could express myself in a different way, more than just regurgitating repertoire. And um, I stopped, uh, I, I wasn't the best student. I didn't um, always practice. And I uh, could have done a better job at regurgitating that um, repertoire. But I spent a lot of my time playing the piano just to play it, which for me, it was really healthy um, because now I love music so much. So that's great. Um, yeah, my mom's from England, and so I have an early influence in British rock and pop, especially from the eras like the 60s to the 80s, both American and British. I uh, was really my first um, love of music outside of the piano and something I definitely expressed through the piano. Um, very influenced by like Elton John and Billy Joel especially singing and playing. Um, which is a lot of why Ethan and I clicked too, because Ethan's uh, really into rock music. So um, <laughs> it's true. We, uh, that's that's kind of where we uh, click and on a very fundamental level. Um, I've always been in choirs, I think ever since like fifth grade or so, late elementary into middle school I sang in choir. Um, and I got into musical theater in high school, and that was really fun. And I was able to be in a production here at Drew. It was Spring Awakening. Ethan played bass for that show. Um, it was great. And I found that not only, I, re I was reassured that not only do I like playing music, but I really love performing um, for a group of people and getting to communicate through music. It's really important to me, and it's something I will always do, regardless of where I end up. So um, through those kinds of experiences and through my education at Drew University and being around a wide array of people, I have really diversified, I would say, like the genres of music I like. I'm very into upbeat and positive music, but um, I, you can read the list. There it is. Um, it's not even uh, conclusive. It's just some genres that come to mind. I'm really fascinated by all types of music, and I can always find something to enjoy um, out there. So yeah. Boom. All right, so now we're going to talk about what were our successes and challenges. So through my time here, I've learned that Bob Dylan, Chuck Berry, Jefferson Airplane, um, The Animals, a bunch of other really big names from the 60s, 70s, the later half of the 20th century, have all played at Drew. Um, the concert posters are in the pub for the regulars. You know that. Um, and something, obviously, we didn't have the time to really think about this on a four-year scale was there is not a lot of non-departmental live music at Drew. And the departmental live music at Drew that happens is phenomenal. Um, Elias and I have both been part of those ensembles. We both had the experience. Um, 
But in terms of music that isn't sanctioned by the department, where else could that happen? And one of the conversations that we had with Will McMillan, who's a coordinator of student engagement, and also runs our pub, um, live music and bars just coexist so well. Um, and we laid the foundation to allow not only Duotone, but other student groups to perform um, at the pub. And we've bought back live music, I think, in the same timeline as Dumbs as in the same timeline as other student bands, such as the Automatic, such as the Delegation. Um, I think laying the foundation of bringing live music back to Drew was one of those early successes that we had. And that was simply through a conversation that wasn't an email chain, that wasn't a back and forth, that wasn't calling and getting hit with secretary wall and all these other walls. That was a simple conversation in the pub um, that led there. So obviously, like, we were really hyped when we saw that Dumbs is putting on all of these things outside of Drew. Um, the delegation has picked up and also played two pub shows that were phenomenal. Um, so obviously, like, to show kind of this is working, we reached out to collaborate with uh, Joey from the delegation, one of the other student bands on campus, um, at an event in Madison on April 1st hosted by Dumbs. So there was a very large Drew population at this festival, and I would say about half of the people were music majors, half of the people just existed on campus and really loved music, and to see kind of a wide variety of Drew musicians um, and having, you know, attending the university be what unifies us, um, you really got to see each individual story um, as we came up. Before I move on to social media, just to add to that too, it's been, it's been great that in doing something we kind of planned on doing anyway, we were able to theorize it in this way, especially for our music capstone, to bring out those areas. I think there is this uprising at Drew right now with like music and culture, and it's not just us, but I'm glad to have been a part of it, and it is a shame that it's on the tail end of our experience, <laughs> but... Um, we wouldn't trade it for the world, and it's been really great, and I just hope that that is a trend, let the record reflect, that I hope this is a trend that continues on campus, because I think it's wonderful, and what the department needs, and what our school needs. Yeah. Um, intersectionality, departmental, um, CV, you'll be proud of me for this one. Um, <laughs> I'm also a business major, and I took a course last fall on social media marketing, which was one of my favorite courses in the major, and um, a project for that class for the year was that I had to build a brand, anything I wanted, and um, a shout out to my homies that were also in that class. Um, I had to build a brand, and like I ha we had exercises in class, but it was going to be a semester long thing, and that was definitely a catalyst for like, okay, Ethan, let's let's do this, let's do this thing, because we had already we were already in the weeds of recording and producing the Madav anniversary album, which is out everywhere now. Um, and we've been just spending a ton of time together making music, so it was time to make it official. So we came up with a name, Duo Tone, and we threw it all together. Um, and it was really successful uh, for the class, but also it was a great way to kind of start working on what most self-made musicians need to do, which is that marketing aspect and that putting yourself out there on the internet because those resources exist, and if you don't take uh, take that, take the reins on that, like you won't be, it'll be harder for you to get recognized these days compared to all the other people who are willing to. So um, it's important and uh, it was definitely a challenge but uh, I think a success of this project as a byproduct of everything. And uh, peep this really cool picture of us, this was at our last show April 14th in the pub. It Thank was, you, Robbie. Thanks, Appreciate Robbie. It. Robbie and your own pictures, everybody. <laughs> and posters. And posters, holy heck, really Ooh. good stuff. <laughs> um, we got good friends. And uh, yeah, it was beach themed, it was super fun, and uh, it was great. That was number two of two. But yeah, another really great success and challenge um, was that we wanted to take an approach, being a duotone group, duotone group? See, look, it's so easy. Being a duo group, um, how were we going to fill out our sound? And how were we going to do that in a way that wasn't super fabricated, super obvious, something that just would make a lot of sense. And we researched uh, and 
observed other groups uh, from my local area and also online um, how these bands do that. And there's almost always um, an element of pre-recorded or backup or some sort of uh, digital element to every live perform to most live performances, industry standard, like professional these days. And so one of the restrictions of playing in the pub also is that we couldn't have an acoustic drum set. So we knew we needed to have drums because we love high energy music. <laughs> so for the first concert, we produced all of our drums digitally and they did sound really good. And for the second concert, we were actually able to record them uh, on an electronic kit and Ethan killed it, um, bringing those fourth grade skills back to the table. So we, this is, what you're looking at here is a playlist of all of our songs for our second performance that we just did. Um, it's probably impossible to read, but every red section is the duration of the song, and that indicates what tempo the digital audio workstation, I work in Ableton, will switch to in its mind to play the song at that speed. So you're putting that on automatic, you're setting that up in advance. Um, you're taking all the stems, which are the individual audio lines of everything you've recorded, and you're putting those all in one place. And all you have to do is go out on the day of, is go to the black lines that are vertical, go to the front of them and start, and then with the appropriate count in that we programmed as well, we would hear that and be able to get right in on the song. This made rehearsing really consistent, and this is, uh, it was a super informative process. And it took a little longer because we had to teach ourselves, but it was really excellent uh, to learn how to do that. And we had a ton of fun yeah. uh, taking our skills from having worked on the Mad Ave album and putting them in here. Um, I remember the last time I opened the DAW for an electronic music composition course here at Drew, to when I opened it to start working on duotone things, it was like night and day. So um, that was also a formative experience for us. But yeah, super, super successful in that regard. It's just more cute pictures. I yeah, think. here's just some more pictures. Um, yeah, top left, our most recent show. The uh, corners there are a really good photo shoot we took. I actually, I took those photos. Um, yeah. Uh, Robbie's the best photographer ever, though. Love you. And um, this one on the bottom right was from our first show. Uh, really well edited. Shout outs. Um, and here's some more. Cool. Okay, so today for you, we don't have uh, a whole backing track, uh, blow your ears out kind of set. We're going to uh, show you something a little more intimate uh, for our intimate purposes here today. But yeah, let's go to the front there. Okay.
Can we have another round of applause for all of the seniors? I'm really proud of all of them because I basically said, yeah, do, do you, as it were, and they did. Each presentation was unique. I'm kind of proud that they all kind of connected to their view of the world and what they found interesting. Thank you for coming, and um, be safe going home. Hopefully it's not raining. Thanks again, and congrats one more time. Seniors, fantastic job. Thank you, Concert Hall, Rachel, Ty, and everyone else for being very helpful and very patient. We had issues.
So thank you. Take care.